everybody. My name is Nasr Abu Rahmeh. I am the faculty fellow here at the Kevorkian Center. I just want to start off by welcoming everybody to this, uh, our first event in our Global Uprising series this semester. Um, and I just, if you know, if you, if you haven't been to any of these events before, I just want to say that Global Uprising is a year-long series. Uh, it, it took all of last semester. It's going to run across all of this semester. And it's a year-long series that really revolves around um, one central question, which is um, how do we come to terms with uh, collective action today, right? How do we grapple with uh, the sense of the present and our time as one of generalized insurgency, right? How, how do we come to terms with what seems at least like a present defined at least by the, the frequency and the scale and the intensity of uprising and protest in a certain sense? Um, and part of the impetus for us was to think through what was happening in the streets of New York last summer, but really across the country and in a much wider sense, um, in terms of the anti-racist, the anti-police uprisings, and link them somehow with what was happening in the sort of renewed wave of the Arab uh, protests, the Arab revolts, in mainly in 2019 in, in Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, Sudan, and so on. Um, so here we are. January 26, 2021, one day after the 10 year anniversary of the Egyptian revolution, also known of course as the January 25th revolution. And it was launched on January 25th, not coincidentally, not by chance, but because January 25th is National Police Day. So there's really only one place for us to start today and that is with police. Um, so the event titled today, uh, Police as Politics, Police as War, has asked our participants to respond to a sort of broad set of questions around police and uprising, right? Specifically, um, how has police become the name in a certain sense for a broad sense of systemic injustice, right? That is, in other words, um, how have political regimes everywhere and here, you know, across what's left of the liberal democratic or post-colonial divide come to be seen as nothing more than police, that come to be experienced at least as reduced to their policing function. Um, and how do we link this to questions of racialization, predatory accumulation, or perhaps more, most pressingly for us today, to questions of imperial war, right? If we move past what we know about the militarization of police, um, is there a, how do we grapple with this sense that there's this you know, renewed indistinction between, between policing and war, right? These are the the set of, um, I think, broad framing questions that we are going to get into today. Um, before I get into a very brief note on format, I just want to plug the other series that um, is also a year-long series that's running at the Gavorkian. We'll be starting again this sem later this semester. It's called Digital Forays. It's a kind of exploration into what it means to think and act and be in this digital present. Um, the next event we have coming up in this Global Uprising series is in two weeks time on February 9th. And that is called Insurrection and Reaction. And this is basically an opportunity for us to think about uprising from the right, as it were. So please, you know, join us for those, stick around. Um, I also wanna take this opportunity to thank our colleagues at the Human Rights Initiative at NYU Gallatin for their co-sponsorship. We are very grateful for their support. Um, so a brief note on format and how we'll proceed today. Each of our participants is going to have 10 minutes to sort of stake an intervention into the, into the sets of issues. After that, we're going to have about 30 minutes of discussion between um, our discussant and the, the participants. Um, and then we will open to a wider Q&A session um, with everyone in the audience. Um, and I'd encourage everyone to participate. There are a number of ways you can do so. You can ask um, uh, questions through the chat and, and you don't have to necessarily wait for the Q&A part of that. If you have something that comes to you, you wanna post it, you can post it, you can post it publicly or you can post it to me or one of my colleagues. You can also use the raise hand function in Zoom, right? And we will call on you and you can unmute yourself and you can ask the question verbally. Um, I should also mention that th this event will be recorded. It will be up on our YouTube page fairly soon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, so very brief introductions to our 
for our speakers um, in order of their appearance. And we have today with us um, a set of uh, scholars and activists who have really been at the cutting edge of this research and this thought. And you know, the tremendous turnout for this event, the tremendous registration numbers, I think speaks you know, volumes to the, to the importance and urgency of their work. Um, so we're very, very glad and privileged to have them with us. And I want to thank them again now before we get started. Um, in order of their appearance, Stuart Schrader is the Associate Director of the Program in Racism, Immigration and Citizenship and a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. He is the author of Badges Without Borders, How Global Counterinsurgency Transformed American Policing. Nadia Abulhaj is the Ann Olin Whitney Professor in the Departments of Anthropology at Barnard College in Columbia University. She's also, of course, the co-director of the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University. She's the author of The Genealogical Science, The Search for Jewish Origins, and The Politics of Epistemology. Paula Marr is Professor at the Department of Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the director of the Orphelia Center for Global and International Studies. He's the author of The Security Archipelago, Human Security States, Sexuality, Politics, and the End of Neoliberalism. Our discussant today, our very own Nikhil Pal Singh, who we're very grateful to have with us, is a professor of social and cultural analysis and history here at NYU and founding faculty director of the NYU Prison Education Program. He's also, of course, the author of Race and America's Long War. So thank you all for being with us. And with that, I will turn it over to Stuart. Okay, thanks very much for, for that. Thank you for having me. Um, it's great to see everybody here. So three miles and six months apart, two events push the supposedly contradictory relationship of police and military to their extreme. In June, thanks to a lazy, underprepared and confused chain of command, National Guard helicopters in Washington, DC used their rotor wash to attack Black Lives Matter protesters who were supposedly violating a curfew. And this, dis this display um, that weaponized a, a helicopter emblazoned with a red cross came just a few hours after the vicious and brutal assault on protesters by a range of law enforcement officers so that President Trump and his band of accomplices could um, take a photo of Trump holding a Bible in front of a church. And of course, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Attorney General accompanied the parade. And the response was immediate and universal. Harsh condemnation for a range of violations, including the breakdown in civilian control over the military, the use of military resources to control protected speech, and so on. In other words, the result of this event, like so many others in June and July of 2020, was the demand to get the military out of policing and law enforcement. Even for those people who believe defund the police is the wrong approach or the wrong demand, there was still a widespread consensus that this militarization of protest and crowd control directly ordered by the president for his own vain purposes was a step too far. The military in this sense should not have engaged in policing. Now fast forward to the Capitol insurrection 20 days ago when dozen of Trump, dozens of Trump supporters white power activists, militia members, and their mothers stormed the Capitol uh, trying to kidnap AOC and Nancy Pelosi, or maybe just take a, a few cool selfies. Mm -hmm. So after civilian police were overwhelmed and the Department of Defense and the White House had stalled for long enough to let the whole thing play out, the widespread consensus response was that civilian law enforcement was under-equipped and ill-suited to protect Washington, D.C., and therefore supplementing it with tens of thousands of National Guard soldiers was an absolute necessity. So in six months, the liberal consensus in the United States has shifted from condemnation of the use of military and law enforcement to approval for the use of military in law enforcement. And so for people like me who've been trying to make sense theoretically of the relationship of police and military, um, to offer critiques of this notion of militarization of police, um, it's been, perhaps to use a term we should use more often in critical theory, really annoying. So it's not that I don't think it's bad when cops dress up like soldiers, but I do think that a criticism of these surface level phenomena risks submerging a more thoroughgoing, thoroughgoing critique of police as such. Theoretically, I think the idea of militarization of policing contains some presuppositions that are unsupportable. They fall apart under historical scrutiny. First is the idea that there was once a clear bright line between police and military, which has since become porous. Uh, 
Second, uh, the idea that militarization represents an exogenous contamination rather than an endogenous property of police. Third, that militarization is visibly manifested rather than internally expressed through hidden routines and practices. So in, in my research, uh, along with that of, of other uh, colleagues, including Nicole Siegel, Julian Goh, Matt Guariglia, and others, it's become clear that police um, have, have long been deeply intertwined with the military, despite persistent protestations that the two are distinct. At the levels of personnel, training, equipment, and so forth, it's exceedingly difficult to find this liberal fetish object of a civilian police agency that is totally distinctive from the military. And Nicole Siegel, for example, argues through, through a genealogical account that police are always already military. And she makes this case by looking at the US Office of Public Safety, which is the same Cold War agency that I look at in, in my book, Badges Without Borders. So in, in short, she and I agree that this outfit rigorously defended the distinctiveness of civilian policing from military operations, even as the actual work that it did was designed to accomplish the erosion of this distinctiveness through exchanges of training, technology, personnel, and missions. So this critique, therefore, is useful, probably, to explain why it was so unsatisfactory to decry the events of June as the over-militarization of law enforcement. After all, civilian police were deeply involved in the violence against protesters, even if the more surprising aspect was the involvement of the Department of Defense. But then how can we make a critique of the over-militarization of law enforcement um, when the insurrection on, uh, in January overwhelmed the intentionally civilianized police and the military had to be you know, called in to save democracy or, or whatever it did? Um, you know, it arrived late in the night and is hanging around to this day to protect the Senate impeachment trial. So was it the distinctiveness of the military from police, the liberal fetish made flesh that would save democracy? Weirdly, the point of the argument would be that because the military is not police, it would be more effective at the police mission of basically standing around and making sure nobody climbs the fence and tries to get into the Capitol building. So the so following the logic that I'm laying out, therefore, I think our critique must be that actually military is always already police. So to bring this um, perhaps a bit closer to what unites us here, let me offer another genealogy. Um, it doesn't maybe go back as far as, as always implies, but going back to the early 20th century and to debates in international law at the very meeting point of insurrection, imperialism, racism, war, and police all of the words that concern us today. So this was a debate between an army officer named Elbridge Colby and another legal scholar named Quincy Wright in the late 1920s. So Colby wrote an article called How to Fight Savage, Savage Tribes. He said that in a war among the civilized, a distinction between combatant and non-combatant would prevail. But in a savage war, no such distinction would, could, or should be drawn. In other words, to simplify, international law did not apply in the case he was looking at, which was the bombing of Damascus. He said, quote, the real essence of the matter is that devastation and annihilation is the principal method of warfare that savage tribes know. Excessive humanitarian ideas should not prevent harshness against those who use harsh methods. For in being overkind to one's enemies, a commander is simply being unkind to his people. So his argument examining the bombardment of rebels in Syria suggesting that perhaps not much has changed in quite a long time. Um, he, he claims that savage tribes simply do not know international law and do not observe it. So Colby was responding to this guy, Quincy Wright, who wrote an article called The Bombing of Damascus. Colby knew that France was making the case that international law did not apply to its bombing of non-combatants, but Wright disagreed, and he thought international law should apply. The point wasn't for him that international law could never apply. Right, granted that savage and barbarous peoples that exist and they could be targeted in ruthless aerial attacks that had exceeded international laws protections because they themselves were unlikely to adhere to international covenants. But in this case, the defenseless Syrian rebels should not have been bombed, he argued, because they were in the process of forming a state. They were under tutelage, a process explicitly, recon explicitly recognized by the League of Nations. So Wright noted that the French justified their attack by using the term insurrection. And this justification refused to recognize that you know, an insurrection could tend towards self-government. 
He said France apparently looks upon the activity of her forces as police measures outside of international law. So Colby responds and agrees with this French argument and he even extends it. He argues that international law could not apply as such in a situation like this because ultimately the commanders on the ground needed to have discretion. That's what made those commanders civilized in the first place. He said, it's, it's good to be decent, it's good to use proper discretion. Law therefore might sometimes apply and to be civilized was to know the difference. The unknowable threat had to be systematically excluded from legal protection. He says the inhuman act thus becomes actually humane for it shortens the conflict and prevents the shedding of, of more excessive quantities of blood. It was not a choice between charity and vengefulness, but instead the practical combination of the two on the part of commanders. It was the ideological legitimacy of charity that is conferred upon vengefulness. This is the essence of civilization for him. So why is the word police in all of this? To wrap up my remarks. Police concerns the heterogeneous and endlessly emergent list of objects that are not explicitly outlawed. Police refers to the small, to the actions that do not rise to the levels of law's legitimacy. And Wright's complaint is that the massive violence of aerial bombings just simply is not small. It's exorbitant to police, despite French justifications that these actions fell under the rubric of police, of the discretionary maintenance of order. Now, the debate between Wright and Colby reflected not simply the ambiguities of international law. It was a debate about whether the military could enact police power. Both conceded that it could, but for Wright, that meant a very narrow application. But Colby, I think, actually had a clearer view of the situation. And it bears mentioning that he was a, an, an army officer. It was not simply the discretion that defined what fell under the rubric of police. It was that the object of police power was that which needed to be sacrificed or even brutalized in deeply uncivilized fashion to preserve civilization. Militaries were to adhere to international law, but sometimes their missions required that they skirt its provisions. And the name for this would be police because police is indeterminate at its essence, which is why it remains the irreducible substrate of governance in a world beset by insecurities. And so I'd argue that to apply Colby's argument to the present, what we see in the military response to the capital insurrection and even the application of the term insurrection is a desire to see unrestrained and uncivilized violence applied to the rioters essentially to treat them as a savage tribe. And what's more interesting even perhaps is that you have some figures in the crowd like the Q shaman who seem to wanna to call the liberal bluff on this one. So where does this leave us? Of course, there's much more to be said. This is a complicated history. Um, maybe we'll figure it out by the end of today's event. But the fundamental point here is that the demand that military engage in policing is the obverse of the demand that police don military gear, as both presume that to protect the civilized, it will be necessary to use unrestrained violence toward the uncivilized, and that will be the mark of their lack of civilization, the, um, being the object of unrestrained violence. This is why the military is always already police, perhaps even more so than police are always already military, meaning that embedded within the military is the ability to use police power. Whereas a critique of the militarization of policing that we commonly hear at its strongest is, is actually correct to say that police can exist without military style weapons. The police kernel at the core of the military I'm arguing cannot be eradicated. And perhaps that is what the past six months reveal most clearly. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Stuart. That's really fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Nadia? You're muted, Nadia. Jim, can we unmute Nadia? I think she's having trouble unmuting. I, I've asked her to unmute. There we go. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry. I couldn't unmute myself. Um, hi, uh, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to do this. I think I'm more of the outlier on this topic. Um, so I'm going to come at some of these questions in a rather, should we say, let's hope I get back to them, but this 
talk is coming much more out of work on board you know, than than Okay, thank you. Um, what do we mean by the militarization of the police as a as it's generally spoken of? Um, and I just want to emphasize, I'm really gonna um limit myself talking about the US today. So the hardware are used in war zones that show up in US streets, the training and tactics, certainly the evidence that police are trained to shoot to kill, the war on drugs, etc. Um, as Stuart has pointed out, there's a lot more going on there that's uh, not taken into account by, by such descriptions, but I'm going to leave that aside. For that matter, there's an overlap in personnel. Approximately 30% of police officers in the U.S. are veterans of the military, and although the police force is demographically whiter than its military, where the race, racial distribution adheres more closely to that of U.S. society, as institutions, they both draw on the same class backgrounds largely lower middle to middle class. Moreover, each is, and the military more and more so, a quote-unquote family business. That is, a large percentage of those who join each institution have a family member, a grandfather, a father, a sibling either, who either serves or has served. Nevertheless, as institutions, the police and the military occupy very different moral and political positions in U.S. society. And that has political consequences for opposing war on the one hand and fighting police brutality on the other. And to be clear, in my comments today, I'm actually interested in the place of each institution in liberal or left liberal social imaginary rather than those of the right. In short, while there is a little call among liberals and left liberals to support the police, there remains a widespread sense that regardless of one's positions on the wars, one must quote unquote support the troops. There's a seemingly endless production of journalistic and scholarly accounts about the post-9-11 wars told from the American soldiers' point of view. Reporters embedded in the war zone are back home, anthropologists writing about the post-9-11 wars on the basis of the discipline's hallowed ethnographic method, basically on bases or in military hospitals. Such accounts produce insights into the experiences of war for American troops and the often devastating afterlife of making war. Even some even provide critical readings of militarism, patriotism, and homecoming. Yet all of them represent the wars as an almost exclusively American experience. Many have argued that the wars are barely visible in American, American society, a consequence of the all volunteer force that replaced the draft in 1973. But that's only true if one presumes that talking about soldiers, and more specifically, as I elaborate in forthcoming book, talking about the traumatized soldier is not also talking about war. In effect, through the ubiquity of the figure of the traumatized soldier in public culture today, for the American public writ large, the soldier is the war, and the violence brought on others so very far away barely enters the frame. War stories in fiction, in journalistic accounts, or as ethnography, all narrate, to borrow Carl Morlanti's title, what it is like to go to war. And the obligation to tell their stories or to listen to the stories that they tell and to do so without judgment are framed as some simple lesson, the right lesson, the ethical lesson learned in the aftermath of the American War. This is a powerful edifice of American militarism, and it takes its cue from a particular conservative reconstruction of the war in Vietnam. That is not a critical reckoning with its imperial hubris and brutal military tactics, but a reckoning with the alleged mistreatment of American veterans on their return. In short, if during the war in Vietnam, a political critique of the war and of American imperialism emerged, emerged across large swaths of American society, a decade hence, um, that war had been transformed into what Christian Appy named an American tragedy. Quote, the deepest failure, sorry, the deepest shame related to the Vietnam War was not the war itself, but Americans' failure to embrace its military veterans, unquote. And we live with that lesson today. No matter what else the American public may disagree on, military veterans need to be embraced. So what might any of this have to do with the military and its relationship to the police, or with militarization of the police, and the distinct moral and political spaces they occupy in American society? Let me take a quick detour here through a conversation about war, homecoming, and trauma as moral pain. In her book, After War, Nancy Sherman, who's a philosopher at Georgetown, lays out the contours of what is now named moral injury. That is, it's an understanding of combat trauma that diverges from current definitions of PTSD. Soldier trauma is far less about having experienced overwhelming fear, 
of having been victimized. Instead, their trauma is often born of what they have done, and it is moral rather than simply psychological pain. As part of calling on Americans who have not gone to war um, to help soldiers return, to help them heal, which really is the language of returning, she unpacks what she calls the ritual of thanking men and women for their service. In contrast to many other commentators, Sherman refuses to dismiss the gesture of thank you for your service out of hand. Thanking someone for their service, she argues, is the cultivation of a morally appropriate disposition on the part of civilians in the face of those who have served. As her argument unfolds, Sherman asks civilians to step up in the face of widespread resentment on the part of ex-military personnel, resentment that is often an expression of and rooted in their moral pain. Rather than recoil a response, she wants American civilians to understand that, to understand that resentment and to fashion a productive response. Resentment, she writes, quote, is a way of calling out another for due attention and recognition. And the recognition is really important for work, unquote. There is, and I quote again, the implicit complaint that civilian fellow citizens fail to assume an adequate degree of moral responsibility for the wars that they directly or indirectly help wage and for the after war, the arduous veteran recovery, again, a language of healing, that follows in the wake of going to war. While I don't have time to elaborate, Sherman's book is but one instance of a widespread discourse about the obligation of civilians, that is, American civilians, to care for those who were sent off to war and who have returned in moral and psychological pain. It is up to those civilians to bridge the divide, often referred to as the civil military divide, to reach out. And that is to be achieved in large part by listening. David Wood, a journalist who embedded his American Marines in Afghanistan and then again upon returning home to trace more painful afterlife, he recommends a program developed by a clinical psychologist at Harvard. Quote, her idea was to match veterans with volunteer civilian listeners for a long session of uninterrupted intentional listening. The intentional listening, he continues, is listening with validation, listening without judgment, saying, yeah, that was fucked up, but also I honor your service. Now consider Roy Scranton's words in response to this whole discourse. And Scranton is an Iraq war that he has uh, turned into a, a pretty radical critic of the war. I quote, Imagine that instead of having a conversation as insufficient as it has been, this is written in 2016, about systematic racism, we were having a conversation about the moral and psychological stress American police suffer in the course of patrolling their community. Imagine instead of talking about how Black Lives Matter, we were talking about police health care, police pensions, and police suicide rates. Imagine that instead of trying, however inadequately, to address America's long history of racial violence. We were spending our time trying to educate civilians on their obligation to, quote, bridge the police civilian divide, unquote. You don't have to imagine it. That's the very conversation we've been having for the last 14 years about war, unquote. Scranton may have spoken too soon about what Black, sorry, I just lost my time. <laughs> about, oh, sorry, may have spoken too soon about what one could not imagine being talked about vis-a-vis -vis the Black Lives Matter movement. Nevertheless, it's also the case that thanking police for their service or for the obligation to care for and listen to the stories police tell about their psychological and moral pain born of the violence they have unleashed would certainly be a far more controversial demand than it is vis-a-vis -vis military troops. Perhaps this is where militarism and the police for the militarization of the police diverge, where imperial war and domestic policing remain decidedly distinct, and where the two institutions are not moral equivalents in US society. One, the police, is a flashpoint in a political crisis wrenching the country apart. The other, the military, is really not so divisive at all. One, we may oppose the wars, but the military is oh so professional. I think that's part of the thing about the National Guard, actually, at the Capitol. Think of all the support among liberals for the generals who brought, brought in to reign in Trump. Among those further on the left, one can criticize the military as an institution, but what about the troops? How do we account for their experiences? What are our moral and political obligations towards those who have served in these wars? Take the following quotes from anthropologists, both decidedly anti-war and critical of the military as an institution. I quote, 
I have made a deliberate decision here to steer clear of a direct engagement with the subject of killing. What soldiers say about it, how they feel about it, what it might mean to them, and so on. In a way, this is simply an outgrowth of the ethnographic material. Soldiers spoke far more about feelings of vulnerability and exposure than they did about killing, unquote. This was someone who did ethnography at Fort Hood. Or, as another anthropologist, Zoe Woolworth counts, quote, at war and at home, soldiers talk about what they do as a job or work more often than anything else. And I was actually at a Columbia discussion where this happened too. And yet, she continues, encounters between soldiers and others slide into the register of national sacrifice and tropes of heroism. Even when he wishes it were, a soldier's work is not allowed to be the same as a carpenter's. The violence that is its most fundamental characteristic is framed and reframed again and again, continuing calling, continually calling forth some kind of accounting for justification. Surely, however, even if national sacrifice and the trope of heroism are worthy of critique, and not just because they are received uncomfortably by some of those who are on the receiving end of such platitudinous as patriotism, as she argues. Surely we should not concede the point of view that the military or that war is just another job, just like being a carpenter. Surely we must speak of killing of those who American troops have harmed. And surely no journalist or anthropologist who is decidedly anti-police would defer to the words and feelings and experiences of police officers in the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. That's fantastic. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Amar. Thank you. These talks have been uh, really stimulating, and I'm really glad to be back, at least by Zoom, in uh, the Kaforkin Center, where it all began. Uh, so my talk today is um, called Provisionally Depolicing, Five Continuing Epistemological Revolutions. So let me just position myself in the middle of some circuits uh, and timelines leading up to um, 2011. Uh, I am going to both reinsert my um, process of theorization into the narrative and the you know, uh, spatial frame of the quote unquote Arab Spring. But then as I do so, I'm also going to radically reframe and kind of dismember the way that that's uh, come to be commemorated. But first, let me just situate some spaces and timelines uh, which my work was located as I arrived in 2011. So before that, in the 1990s, I was working at the United Nations and in kind of a technical you know, development and conflict resolution capacity, which became very frustrating and very um, limiting in the end, but working on paramilitary violence in Colombia against indigenous people, working on the decommissioning of military and death squads in El Salvador for civil war, and working on in support of Secretary General Boutros Potostali's creation of police and statistical agencies in Palestine during the period of the Oslo Accords. So I was there in the UN when Secretary General Boutros Ghali, when there was a kind of a coup against him, the only UN leader Secretary General removed. And that was tied to, you know, kind of um, uh, Madeleine Albright's um, animosity towards Boutros Ghali's plans for UN-led police and peacekeeping forces that would be separate from national driven police and military operations. Um, and so he was called the champion of police keeping, this new word police keeping. So I, I launched that just to, 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 you know, that there was a struggle in which we had in a, in a very, um, you know, historically important Egyptian Arab nationalist and cosmopolitan who was leading uh, new kinds of policing and security operations in a way that radically destabled the emergent kind of neoliberal security order. Um, but this got me, you know, this kind of, when Boris Ghali left, I kind of left that universe also realizing the political frustrations tied to that particular approach to humanitarian police keeping, police keeping and the kind of blurring of the police and military operations of the global sphere. Um, so then entered into this more kind of um, journalistic and social movement context in which I learned so much more <laughs> than I did at the UN from social movements 
on the ground, struggling with militias, with um, death squads, which, with forms of socially organized extermination against um, black communities in Brazil, against uh, sex worker um, social movements in Brazil and Egypt, and around um, working class communities and, and feminist groups in Egypt. I lived in Brazil for four years and in Egypt for 11 years. And so those cases and this kind of longer durée of looking at the struggles around how to imagine um, either a reformist or a radically abolitionist approach to policing in this particular historical moment of transition from a series of um, imperial Cold War projects towards newly emergent multipolar empires and regional formations of reinventing what it is to um, create a security state and its policing and military apparatuses. So um, at that point, so arriving then at the moment of 2010 in Tunisia and 2011 in Egypt, uh, there had already been, of course, many years of struggles, particularly in how to radically reimagine what the state is when we don't uh, imagine it as a single male uh, authority who is preserving their power through uh, repressive policing uh, actions. That kind of metaphor and that kind of the journalistic image of the state and sometimes the human rights or civil rights methodology of apprehending the state, constantly focusing on personality of an individual male leader and then understanding the state is basically an attempt to preserve a particular um, narrow political economic pyramid built in order to support that leader. That had been challenged by a series of social movements across the region, but tied into movements around the world that were also trying to reimagine an epistemology of the state that wasn't going to reproduce either on the one hand, this phallogocentric, this kind of very phallic notion of a, uh, you know, an individual power figure atop security apparatus, or on the other hand, the kind of humanitarian option, which is a highly legitimized, re-legitimized blurring of police and military operations into this kind of police keeping model that had been proposed by um, the reformists that were kind of orbiting around the UN, as well as around many, um, uh, you know, modernizing um, police forces in Brazil and Egypt. So, you know, I have to rush through this, but I just want to underline that what I think is most exciting, and then we of course come across the, and it's important to underline why the framing of the Arab Spring as a term, as alluring as it was, um, also played into this dynamic of reproducing and salvaging the discredited framework of authoritarianism studies that creates exactly that kind of simplistic notion of a police state that props up a, a you know, a, a authority figure in power. Um, this kind of the Arab Spring function as a term, which is a form of doubled exceptionalism. The fact that the spring is occurring in a particularly so-called, you know, um, backward region that had not yet democratized and modernized is then the exception, uh, the Orientalist notion of the, of the Middle East region as an exception to modernity. And then the spring being the exception to the exception and exceptionally exciting moment of forward timeline, um, rushing forward, which then redoubles the exceptionalism. So to get out of that doubled exceptionalism, we ha uh, need to um, continue to disaggregate the fetishes and the uh, forms of monolithic analysis that dominated both authoritarianism studies and the exceptionalisms that coalesced around the imagination of the Arab Spring as a time and space. So quickly, what I've uh, in the writings I've done since then, of course, my, my uh, interest is in conveying some of the incredible articulations, the epistemological revolutions and the new concepts that come out of this challenging of this uh, simplified phallic model of both the state and of uh, police power in order to understand, in order to provide a research um, agenda and an activist uh, manifesto for how to reconceptualize and engage power. And in the end, in order to reinvent what governance is and what the state can be. So first, I think that there's um, four or five um, reframing devices that, that, are, that constitute this epistemological revolution. So first activists asserted that state violence is structural and systematic, but not monolithic or 
or pyramidal. Um, so that's in this, the way that the activists that I write about and that I work with in Brazil, in the US, in Egypt, disaggregated as our speakers have been doing here, um, the, con the spectrum of coercive state power, Spe specifically looking at particular police forces, how they're different from paramilitary formations. For instance, ICE in the United States is a paramilitary formation. Amnir Merkezi in Egypt is a paramilitary formation, different from police, different from the armed forces and the uniformed armed forces. Militias and their social grounding. Militias in Brazil, in Colombia, in the United States, in Egypt, in Lebanon. Militias are a specific formation. Prison guards and prison unions. Sometimes they're a subsector of police organizations. Sometimes they're their own economy. They have their own racial history. Sometimes they're connected to factory security guards. Sometimes they're not. Mercenary companies, local and global. Of course, the armed forces and their diff each branch has often its own form of capitalism that it reproduces and articulates as a technological and tactical innovator. Intelligence services, of course, and all, all kinds of surveillance social media. Um, each of these, if they're collapsed just into the metaphor of security, or if they're collapsed into each other, we lose both moments in which to, to intervene, to change, to abolish, to defund, to displace. But if they're understood monolithically, and much worse, if they're understood monolithically to all be controlled by a single puppet master, whether it's the metaphor of empire, or whether it's the metaphor of the dictator, then activism loses a lot of traction and there's an, often an inability to make um, radical change. So I think that's something I've learned a lot is really try to be specific about the social formations of coercion and not to adopt in the end what is a liberal metaphor that renders all forms of coercion as just the state or the dictator and everything else um, uh, is society and all those mediating forms of coercive power, each with its own political economic and its own subjective formations of race, masculinist supremacy, mas uh, racial supremacy, certain class supremacies are very specific. So second, um, activists brought, uh, diverged radically from the kind of either the liberal uh, rights-based and uh, kind of law and protection-based model towards a radical notion of um, bodies, spaces, virtual communities, and forms of debilitation as being the center of a new form of materialist or political economy approaches. So in, in you know, the long tradition of political economy approaches tends to place bodies, spaces, um, sexual economies, uh, racial corporations, racial incorporations as at the margins or in the realm of culture of what is seen as materialization of power. But these uh, uprisings very much put bodies, spaces, the sexual violence that constitutes some, the racial systematic violence that conditions possibilities, the systematic forms of debil debilitation of those bodies, and also moving trans species in trans species directions or even towards uh, non-human forms of the subject, but still along, along these um, tendencies to trace the racial, sexual, and um, capacitation processes of creating bodies, not as at the margins of political economy, but as a new, as, a, as the very most intensive forms of materialization. And so when we look at military capitalisms, we look at police, uh, you know, kind of para-capitalist protection racket markets, those are obviously created through the conditioning, the habilitation, debilitation of bodies along the lines of race, class, and sex in very particular ways, of which then, of course, are, are uh, you know, armed with sectarian regimes, ideologies, new missionary forms of religious ideology, et cetera. So that, that uh, kind of resolution of this um, binarization between material and cultural is then really radically uh, reimagined through this centering of body spaces and forms of capacitation um, at the center of political economies, political economies of police and military in particular, which then also brings in coercion as a political economic complex set of actors rather than as a kind of artifact of either a dictator or an artifact of the law, which somehow is seen as non-economic. So um, third, I uh, already mentioned it basically, is, but there was a, a fantastic elaboration of how to think of a repressive 
uh, or an incredibly un inequitable state, not just through the lens of a leader or dictator who's param pyramidally um, organized the state below and who's then articulating like either as a puppet or as a um, uh, relating vertically to empire. So I think that, you know, this, whether it's the slogan, you know, the people want the downfall of the regime that's translated in English as regime, but in Arabic Nizam is more like, you know, the downfall of the order of things and the order of things, the hinge of that order is exactly this notion of monolithic authority. But that itself is what is the object for overturning. It's not the, the individual, it's the actual notion of the state being coterminous with an individual figure. Of course, that's a, you know, a particular phallic epistemology that is overthrown by the various, you know, by the deeply gendered and, um, uh, uh, and embodied uh, alternatives that are enacted and performed in all these uprisings as they unfolded, in which they bred justice and um, uh, bred freedom and social justice, of course, being enacted as an alternative state formation, not just as claim formation, but as an alternative to the kind of phallic methodology of seeing the state as an individual figure tied to imperialism and then and then transmitting power through the a metaphor of police rather than through actual existing economies of police, paramilitarism, militias, and militaries. So finally, I think another for, form, the, another uh, epistemological revolution that has been um, uh, lost a bit in conversations has been the really important uh, transcending of the religion secular binary that happened in the 2010 to 2000. 12 uprisings and the, the radical challenging since then of sectarian political orders. Of course, we know this is happening in the United States, in Latin America, the rise again of liberation theology, whether it's with Rafael Warnock, Senator from Georgia or Maria Li Franco in Brazil and many of the new progressive leaders in Brazil who are most of them from liberation theology traditions or Afro-Brazilian Candomblé Umbanda inspired religious traditions are not um, secular leftists of the of the old type. And I think a lot of that was also happening um, and continues to happen. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, particular neoliberal, neoliberal Islamist groups, but talking about these uh, myriad forms of challenging um, sectarianism from other positions within minority groups or within groups that see themselves outside of the limitations of secular nationalism and its particular um, arrangements of um, identities and priorities. So those are, I think, epistemological revolutions that continue to unfold, that were launched in this period and that continue to um, accelerate. I think, um, uh, just to conclude, I think that uh, if you look at what has happened in the uprisings in Lebanon and Iraq around infrastructure and corruption and sectarian spatialization. If you look at the evolution of um, discourses around military economies and their racialization, uh, either around Amazi Berbers in Algeria or around, of course, blackness and different kinds of um, uh, conflict management histories in the Sudan. Um, and of course, the way that proxy wars have unfolded in Libya, Yemen, Syria, and Bahrain in ways that make us think much more in a complicated way about regional empires of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, um, et cetera, and therefore disaggregate not just the notion of authority and authoritarian rule, but also of imperial and imperial um, machinations. So I hope that gets us started, but thanks a lot. Thank you, Paul, that was great. Um, I want to turn it over to Nikhil, if he's there, and um, uh, the sort of discussion period now between uh, between the four of you. Okay, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, okay. Thank you. Those were um, those were wonderful talks, and there's a lot on the table. So, and I realize we're we want to mostly have a discussion here and and hear from the speakers. So I'm going to be very brief, and and a little bit crude and maybe reductive in um, responding and kind of laying out three, three approaches that I see kind of embedded in, the, in these more sophisticated and complicated talks. And so the, 
the response can bring some of that back out, I hope. Um, I think with, with Stuart, we see an argument in a sense that um, policing is, the, is sort of the master term. I, I use the term master, you know, advisedly, but, but that, that, that you're, you're, when you're dealing with coercive force and state power, whether, it's, uh, whether the iteration is through the military or through kind of domestic law enforcement, policing is, police is the controlling term because police is the term that actually has, has enabled a, a kind of way of thinking about an elasticity, a kind of, a kind of ability to grow forth force outside of the delimitations, say, of law or of norms um, or, of, um, or of certain kinds of constraints that may not be, um, um, may not be amenable to the situations that, is, that, 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 are, that are called forth and that call forth policing as a response. So, so there's that kind of amorphousness to police that is, um, that is kind of at the core of his argument, I think, um, and, that, and one that we see then uh, operating as a, a kind of, a, kind of a, a multi-directional project, one that is both inwardly focused, but then also outwardly focused. And the, the outwardly directed dimensions of police in the United States, of course, have taken the form of counterinsurgency. And the, the, the U.S. has really not fought a war in, in a sense, you know, since World War II. They, these have all been kind of police actions or imagined as kind of policing endeavors in some sense or another. Of course, the term war enters. And so we can, we can, we can think, and I think we should think with, with, with Nadia Abu El Haj about how these terms do occupy this sort of different um, kind of moral and institutional terrains. Um, so, so we see the imbrication, we see them bleeding into one another constantly. And of course, we've been talking about the militarization of police for a long time in the United States. But, but the, the binary is kind of, is not only constantly breaking down, but it's also constantly being reestablished, right? So there's the, this idea that the, the military in the United States um, has a kind of prestige, has a kind of professionalism, has a kind of institutional stability and solidity that we can trust. Whereas the police have this kind of, um, again, this kind of sloppy character that they, they overspill their, their boundaries. They become, they become untrustworthy, they become too violent, they become reckless. Um, and I think that's an interesting, the, the way that binary works, I think is an interesting thing for us to think about because I think it's working that way right now, but it doesn't always work that way at all times. In some ways, these two kinds of forces and the ways they operate together, I think are contingent, right? So, so there, there, there may be, there could be a moment where the military lost prestige and the police were then seen as something that we had to rely upon. You know, and I, I, do, I do have to note that, that, that despite the fact that I think that, 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 that uh, Professor Abu El Haj's argument is absolutely right about the way we've thought about the military in the United States since 9-11, Trump was a kind of departure. You know, there were these moments where Trump would say, well, the troops are suckers, you know, going to war is a sucker's game. And so um, the, on the one hand, the troops may be these kind of, um, the, seen as these subjects of, of kind of moral trauma, as, as, as she argued, but at the same time, war itself has lost a lot of prestige in some ways in the United States as a, as a state-driven project. And so we could think about what that might mean and how the vector has kind of shifted back toward the kind of internal coercive force. Um, um, and and, and the, the debate about police in the United States right now is far from resolved, right? So we could easily see it flipping again as the New York City homicide rate ticks up and up and up and up this year uh, back to a moment where we're talking again about how we need, we need more and better police. And that really does seem to be the approach the Biden administration will probably take. I think Paul Amar offers us a kind of a third, uh, a kind of a third move in this conversation, and one that, um, that 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 pulls us out of the U.S. as a as a kind of focus, which is very important, I think, um, and maybe suggests that the leading edge of the reorganization of coercive power is happening somewhere else. And part of that leading edge and part of what characterizes that leading edge is that we have a kind of a disaggregation of the, of the kind of uh, uh, modalities of coercive force. 
So, so police, military, or even the idea maybe of a state monopoly on legitimate violence is kind of slipping from us in this more moment. And so we have to actually look to uh, almost the kind of proliferation um, and, and, um, and um, uh, porousness you know, porousness of the state and the proliferation of the kind of forms of coercive force that are emerging within that porousness. Whether it's the military at one end of the spectrum, perhaps the most legitimate, the police at the other end, the most elastic, um, um, and then in between these other kinds of, um, of, of, of kind of modes of operationalizing uh, coercive force that are, are, that are less easy to characterize, uh, whether it be the paramilitary or the militia types that are now claiming in some ways to be networked with the police or to have the support or loyalty of the police or maybe to be police sometimes. Uh, and I think even in, um, in Professor Abu Al-Hajj's talk, there's this kind of interesting moment where um, you see the, 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 the revolving of the personnel between these different forms. So you, you're, you're a police, you know, Derek Chauvin is a national guardsman before he goes to become a Minneapolis, you know, policeman. Um, and when I go upstate to New York, uh, to, to the prison we teach in, the first thing you see when you walk in there is a folded flag honoring the corrections officials that served in, in Abu Ghraib and all the prisons in the global war on terror. So it's this, there's a, there's a, there's a movement back and forth between these different modes. And of course, we've been asking a question lately about the militias and how much police are inside the militia, how much sympathy and support there are, um, which again is I think a, 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 a tricky question for us because if, if we're on the side of, of say defund or abolition, um, we then start to worry about the informalization of police forces and, and how they might become um, you know, a danger to us, right? In, in, in a certain way outside the control of any, uh, any legitimate uh, violence. Uh, any, any legitimate um, go governmental um, organization. Um, so, so that's just by way of a very quick and dirty and as I said, crude and reductive sort of summary of these different kinds of approaches. And I guess I, I wanna just ask maybe for the speakers to come back and, and maybe reflect a little bit on, on where, where you all see the kind of trajectory now. Uh, and, and I think it's a, it's a difficult question to answer, an admittedly difficult question, because we have come now again to this juncture where we sort of are um, uh, on the one hand kind of moving back into some sort of more normalized idea of governance um, that maybe once again is go going to be organized around the idea that the police are a, a re-legitimated really in this moment when they've been so delegitimated under, under Trump. Uh, and on the other hand, I think we're moving back to a moment of the reassertion of the kind of imperial um, uh, kind of ambit of American power. I mean, under the guise of say repairing alliances, but also under the guise of kind of being this, this leading edge force. Whereas in some ways Trump marked a very explicit idea that we would retreat into a world that is actually more characteristic of the one I think Amar is describing, where there's a, a, a more porous, disorganized, kind of multipolar, multi-scalar exercise of power that is, that is not clearly being directed from any kind of um, central authority or even an authority that has a pretense of being a central authority. Um, so I wonder if, if all of you have any thoughts about um, where, where you think the, the kind of trajectory of this discussion is going. I think the way you've all framed it is, is very, very interesting and all of you offered a lot for our, our thinking. So I'll stop there and, um, and turn it back and maybe, maybe we could go around and have another round of comments and that be could become a conversation. Stuart, do you want to start? No, but I will. Um, <laughs> th th thanks for that. Um, yeah, I really appreciate um, your your um, summary of, of 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 our conversation. I, I mean, I, I I do think that that you know there is um, a pendulum swing on offer. Um, certainly, you know.
Biden, um, what Biden represents in terms of, of police and law enforcement and what Trump represents in terms of police and law enforcement, I think really speak to different kind of factions within um, police agencies and, um, you know, different approaches to police. And, and you know, I, I think kind of in keeping with what Paul said that th there's value in being precise and trying to do some disaggregating of um, different modes of, of, of coercion and state violence and so forth, and, and even disaggregating um, different kind of power structures within um, the kind of broad field of, of law enforcement, military, and so forth. Um, and, and, and I think that will, you know, doing that kind of disaggregating will put us in a better position to understand what comes next. I mean, one, one thing that happened at the very tail end of the Trump administration, um, I think it was on the, the last day of, of Barr's uh, um, reign as attorney general, he released a, a report of a commission that had been meeting for the past year or so um, which was called the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice. In fact, stealing the title from Lyndon Johnson's um, commission, which was really kind of the zenith of a liberal reformist approach to law enforcement in the 1960s. And so Trump's commission issued a report, I think it was December 22nd, and it kind of, you know, came and went. No, nobody noticed that it came out. There was basically no coverage of it. Um, but what it was trying to do was basically not just repudiate kind of Black Lives Matter and defund the police, but really repudiate, um, you know, ev everything that um, every liberal law enforcement reformer, you know, has said since, you know, the, since the 1960s, right? And then, you know, I just heard yesterday that, that now Biden is going to appoint a new commission to examine police. And so we're going to probably in a year get another report, and they'll just have totally, um, you know, uh, opposed political viewpoints from within law enforcement. So that's obviously a relatively narrow scope of political viewpoints. Um, but there will basically be no admission that that what you know Biden's commission is going to say is actually different from what Trump's commission said, and that there are different um, kind of factions within law enforcement. So uh, you know, I, I think that from a critical perspective, it's it's useful to try to pay attention to some of these currents. Now, that doesn't mean that necessarily we you know we can um, you know trust them to to remain opposed. I think actually the history of these opposing currents within policing in the United States over the several de past several decades is finding accommodation. And I think they will continue to find accommodation with one another. Um, that's, you know, and basically the, the growth model of, for the carceral state is, is how they accommodate each other. Um, so if we, if, 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 but, but the, what follows from that is we want to find a way to end this kind of growth model. Um, we need to break that accommodation and, and therefore paying attention to some of these factions might be useful. So that's just my um, kind of initial uh, reaction to kind of, you know, what I'm expecting in the next, um, you know, little bit of time. I, you know, and I think there are also just going to be really dramatic efforts, again, to just like sweep under the rug everything that has transpired and, and kind of forget and, and move on as, as best as possible um, by a variety of, of powerful figures within law enforcement. Again. Yeah, sorry. Thanks for um, that. I don't know that I can answer your forward looking question. Um, I let me say just a few things in general. I mean, I don't disagree with you that I mean, of course, I think these relationships go up and down and the kind of reconstruction of the military. It was very much after its complete disintegration after the Vietnam War in a sense that it had failed. So I think that it could that we could be at a moment where it shifts again. But I guess I think I more see the possibility of a kind of expansionist role in the Biden administration, you know, in that sort of more humanist, you know, humanitarian, humanitarian war mode, um, or in the name of humanitarianism that really characterized the Clinton administration. But I also think it's because I'm not sure, I mean, as much as I think, yes, Trump, the troops are suckers, but I think that it was very contradictory. And it was like the one thing that we unify, finally the Republicans would come out against him when he insulted the troops. So in some ways I feel like the military is the one institution that may have survived the Trump administration with some, with its kind of 
reputation intact and going right they were the ones that ultimately were going to defend the constitution they're not going to overthrow except you know after that fiasco at lafayette square um so in some sense i think the coherence and regard for the military has survived the trump administration has kind of united uh factions you know political factions of the country particularly democrats and liberals but even further on the left and the right um and so it's actually well positioned to move forward in a sort of uh, continued role in the world. Um, and the only other thing I was going to say about the trade back and forth, which I think is important, is it's also after every war, there's this woman, Catherine Blue, who's written a book on the rise of the militia movement, right? And as she points out, it's not just that there's a trade between, which I did mention, I mean, a lot of the same personnel in policing and the military, but um, after every war since World War II, the rise of right when kind of white supremacist stuff. So you have these these different trades be cleansed through a kind of civil rights era. I mean, more civil rights intervention, Ella Obama, as a way to position them against the militia movement. Um, but I don't, you know, that's sort of beyond my expertise. Well, thanks for these comments, Nikhil. Um, yeah, I thought just to pick up on a, a couple of these that I think, uh, you know, threads that are weaving together really well. So one is, you know, what kind of political work does the persistence of a binary between police and military do in modernity in general, and that that circulates so powerfully in in, in all of the world regions that we're, we've been talking about. Um, you know, the, the fact that the police in Egypt became so associated with the Boltageya and the thugs and protection rackets and uh, the most corrupt forms of private security, you know, re-legitimized military rule and military capitalism in Egypt. In Brazil, when the police, when militias attached to Bolsonaro or attached to the governor of Rio or attached to death squads, you know, become indistinguishable from the police, then, you know, like now there's several armed forces generals in the government. And if Bolsonaro is impeached, we'll basically have a military government in Brazil, which is being welcomed by almost all sides because of this idea. And I think it's, it's that the military in so many, and exactly in I think the way that Nadia's work is pointing out, the military remains the, you know, illiberal constituent other of a kind of neoliberal or a kind of chaotic capitalism that retains its prestige, even though it's of course an illiberal actor in every sense, but it, it becomes the only part of the state and the public sector that is not critiqued by neoliberals or by the business community or by austerity politics globally in all regions of the world. It remains the sacrosanct public, it remains sacrosanct state, it remains the people when they're good and dressed up and not lumpen, lumpenized. It remains the constitutive illiberal other of either forms of chaotic capitalism or liberalization. So, I think that's, if, I mean, that's, I don't know if I would, I'm sure there needs to be a lot of unpacking on that, but it's a, it's a very powerful binary. And that's, I think, again, when I'm talking about disaggregating categories um, or even disaggregating empires and allowing, you know, analytical space to talk about the Turkish empire or about the Saudi empire, or about the Brazilian empire, which if you look at missionaries in Africa from Brazil, you would be surprised that anyone thinks the Brazilian empire is something from the past. Um, so I think that disaggregation process, it's not to just um, say that politics is becoming atomized and unmoored. It's, um, it's a way to create openings for radical engagement from many angles at once. And it's a way for people in their 
embodied and spatial and political ec economic location, you know? I mean, it's in the end using these kind of more Gramscian metaphors of, of space and articulation and access from multiple points, but that those multiple points do adhere in, you know, a nizam, in a regime of articulations. Um, and so again, so I think that, but binaries, the way that, you know, these kind of phallic epistemologies of a binary between the military and the police, between a kind of lumpen version of the people and a militarized version of the people in, in the armed forces, um, you know, I think those are very powerful binaries, but we need, I think, part of the revolutions of 10 years ago was to break, to challenge those binaries in forms of resistance organi organizing and consciousness. Great. Um, maybe I'll ask one more question and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, and, and this is kind of kind of a, inspired by by what what Paul Lamar just said, which is sort of the Gramscian question, and maybe it's a question about the the balance of forces and how we think about them right now. Because I think one of the things that really has struck me over the last year is um, not only the the willingness of um, the willingness of people in the United States, but obviously this has been going on for a long time now to to actually fight the police. Um, and and can physically confront the police uh, after having marched in New York over decades and been very very effectively controlled by the police. It, it was very interesting to me to see the degree to which the police did not have control over a lot of the events of the past year. Um, obviously, that was true at the Capitol as well. So the Capitol wasn't the only moment where there was a kind of sense, perhaps, of, of police weakness. Um, um, and I think that, that the, the, the question of the military um, as a force that is uh, perhaps stronger, but one that must be restrained, you know, is another kind of aspect of this. Um, when, you know, when Tom Cobb and went in, into the New York Times and said, we need to call out the military to basically smash the protest. It was, it was that very, one of those very pivotal moments in this, in, this, um, in this conversation in the country, right? Which is what are the military going to be used for? Um, and I, I think clearly we, we still think of the Amer American military as a very powerful organization in the world. I think the Pentagon employs like over 3 million people. And the U.S. still spends about 40% uh, of the total world amount on on, the, on its military. So, so it's a massive force. Um, but but I think going all the way back to um, you know Madeleine Albright's famous you know you have this big army. What are you gonna, you have this big military? What you know why can't you use it? I think that question is again there. You know what what is it good for? Uh, what is it what is it supposed to do uh, for us? Um, what, what is it going to do in the world? Is it, is it just a deterrent or is it actually something that can, can make things happen that, are, um, that, that sort of move things forward? So I think there's a way, I guess what I'm saying when I ask a question about the balance of forces is that, that the, these institutions themselves are also in a kind of crisis. Um, they have a kind of crisis around their purpose. Um, they have a crisis after you know, 30, 40 years of law and order in, in the United States of, 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 of whether they've actually produced a better, more stable, more flourishing society, which I think most people would say that they, they have not. Um, the calls to defund are just the edge of a much broader uh, argument that we need to decarcerate um, and we need to change the orientation towards um, crime and punishment in general. So, 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 so these are in some ways optimistic points. I mean, these are points of perhaps opportunity. Um, and so I wonder if you, you all have any thoughts or refle further reflections on that, that question. How powerful are these forces um, in some ways? Um, and and can, they be, um, can they be repurposed or, 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 or redirected? Well, I, 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 can, I can start. Um, I guess I, you know, I, I think it, it is true that, that we're, we're probably, you know, at a moment of, of transformation with the, um, 
Department of Defense and its kind of doctrinal and strategic orientation. I mean, I think that this was already underway and Trump kind of accelerated it to some degree. Um, interestingly, I, you know, I think that one place where there's a lot of agreement between Biden people and Trump people is about the you know, necessity of confronting China. Um, and, 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 and the, the Pentagon's kind of uh, redirection is away from the kind of, you know, um, small wars orientation of the past two decades toward, you know, basically big wars. Um, and what, what was so interesting, you know, I mean, in, in my remarks, I pointed to the kind of contradiction of, of um, you know, June to January, but even um, in over the summer, you know, right after that, that you know, event of, of the helicopter um, flying over Lafayette Square, just like a few weeks later, there was a news story that came out about the Pentagon basically um, shutting down its urban warfare kind of like internal think tank. Um, so, you know, and that, that, that basically indicated that, that like that they just don't think that um, the action is gonna be at the level of the, the kind of small war um, or the police action. It's going to be, um, you know, big time war with China. But then of course the question becomes kind of going to what Nikhil said, like who who in the Pentagon actually wants war with China? It's like they want to be ready for any contingency, but they don't actually want to do it. So um so it, it, that that makes it even even I think more kind of complicated and challenging to figure out like whether whether this is a moment of of kind of opportunity for um pulling back and restraining the, the Pentagon, um, you know, for making a left argument about, um, you know, less militarism, um, or, 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 or is it just um, the, the kind of incoherence, does it actually just make it very hard to figure out what to, what to point to and where to put the pressure? Um, I'll stop there. Yeah, if I can jump in. I mean, I think just two quick thoughts on this. One is, yeah, on the one hand, it's imagining the big war with China, but at the same time, you know, the kind of light footprint warfare and special ops is not is itself expanding and certainly not going anywhere. And the fact that it's less visible uh, doesn't mean that there hasn't been, they're in fact expanding their footprints in parts of East Africa. I mean, these so-called light footprint wars. So I think the Pentagon is imagining war at two extremes. And I just want to say as an aside of something that was said before, Nikki, I actually, I, I worry about saying that we really haven't had war since so World War II. These are effectively police actions, but I think that's what war has become. I mean, I think counterinsurgency war is what imperial war in the 20th and 21st century is. And I would really want to hold on to calling it war because mm -hmm. the scales of destruction, I think get really, um, well, there's the political question of the US goes to war and claims it doesn't declare war, but you know, the scale of destruction in these counterinsurgency wars is of a whole other level um, than the scales of destruction in domestic policing. And I think it's really important to keep that in focus and especially in a country that fights its wars in someone else's soil. So we never really have to pay it. I mean, so the term civilian in this country means someone who has not experienced war, right? Um, so I had another thought, but I can't remember what it was now. Oh, I know. I'm I'm more optimistic about. I mean, I agree with you that sort of increasing willingness to confront the police on the U.S. American streets has been both striking and encouraging. But I see no parallel anti-military, no parallel anti-militarism uh, move in American left movements. I think it's it's become so so strongly domestically focused and interior in its focus that I'm far less optimistic about the possibility of reigning in US imperial power. As much as there is talk of solidarity, it just doesn't it doesn't have the same cash. It doesn't have the same I mean there's no street movement that's equivalent. Mm -hmm. Lamar? Yeah, and to focus on, um, yeah, then the, to think another step along the path toward abolitionist um, epistemology and how that's practicable both in the police and the military sphere. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sure there's some 
activists here that uh, have a very nuanced vocabulary for thinking about this, but you know, from experience in, in Egypt or recently in Lebanon or in, in South America, or, you know, the, the idea of police abolition is a long one, even if it doesn't have that specific term. But basically the idea is to return to defining what are the social roles for the public and, uh, and you know, social participation in governance and you know, if it's around drugs and pharmaceuticals, then that's a health response and a decriminalization response and expanding access to mental health and to proper you know, pharmaceuticals and legalized um, forms of recreational drugs. You know, that's the conversation that's been happening for a long time. That is, a, is an abolitionist conversation, a massive decrim of an entire sector replaced by redistribution of health resources and social rights is decrim, you know, and uh, just following that same lead and police, instead of arresting homeless people, they're going to, we're gonna have a redistribution of housing resources and a radically transformative notion of community sovereignty over property, housing, squats, etc. I mean, every sector you can go like that and activists have been, even, you know, debt, uh, mitigation and um, debt justice movements in terms of getting the police out of regimes of policing debtors and, and poverty that have been created by debt regimes. All these things have a non-police, uh, very elaborated and, and substantive project of that's based upon redistribution, social redistribution, social services, uh, participatory, social intervention and a revalorization of public structural intervention in the sector, none of those, you know, require police intervention. I think that's a great conversation that's been happening over the last 10 years worldwide is that not everything requires a security response, that redistribution is the opposite of security. Social justice and social redistribution and participatory processes for doing that is the opposite of security understood through a police framework. So, but that could also be transferred to the military sector. I think like we were talking about before, it's a harder push because the military has preserved this prerogative of being the good public sector, you know, perversely, not for all those that it's occupying and targeting, but being efficient, being, you know, good at delivering health and engineering and um, benefits, you know, the only mode to upward mobility for racialized peoples and immigrants. All those things are, should be attributes of the public sector in general, not the military sector. So I think if the public sector started articulating those routes to, to efficiency and capacity and mobility in ways that redistribute participation and resources, then the military's hoarding of that legitimacy would begin to dissolve. Um, so I think the process is not that um, obscure. I think it's sector by sector, replacing security with redistribution, replacing participatory social justice with protectionist, you know, call the cops to solve a problem, call the military to provide organization. And I think as someone mentioned that chat points, that is essentially a popular sovereignty or a community sovereignty based ethic. And I think that the legitimation of the policing through reformist movements or even by you know, feminist and LGBT racial justice actors that just reform the police, we all know that that's not gonna cut it alone, that there has to be an entirely different set of interventions sector by sector that are seen as not, that are doing much better than a criminalizing or a militarizing response would, would uh, implement. Okay, uh, we, we have, I just wanna remind the audience that we have a little bit of time for some Q and A. Um, th th that was really incredibly rich conversation, and I just want to remind you all that you can post questions in the chat. We don't have much time, and we, I think we can go a little bit after the hour. But um, we have some time for Q and A. You can post questions. I see a couple, um, and you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question verbally. Um, I wanted maybe just to. I had a quick question to Michiel's last one. 
um, in terms of this question of, of a balance of forces, maybe while people gather some thoughts, you don't have to answer it now, but just to, just to throw it into the fray. Um, and I was just listening to that last bit of the conversation. I was, you know, if we took it, take it back to this point about what was happening in the streets here globally over the last 10 years, in terms of what we can learn about policing and this balance of forces from uprising, from the uprisings themselves, from the, from the protest movements themselves. And there seems to be a, a, a certain kind of tension here that we're kind of grappling with in terms of, a, I mean, here in terms of a political praxis, in terms of, in terms of you know, what, what we learn from these movements. Um, on the one hand, the sense that, you know, confronting the police necessarily on the streets and the sort of renewed alacrity with which people are doing that is crucial, it's constitutive. We've heard so much about the burning of the police station in, in Minneapolis. I mean, you know, you, you, you can't read about the Egyptian revolution without reading about the 90 police stations that were burnt in the space of a few days. So there's something uh, sort of seemingly necessary in, in uprising, you know, in, in confronting this as a kind of old enemy. But I wonder if there's a kind of a flip side to this, that there is a kind of renewed sense today that there is an overemphasis on police in, in, in these forms of street politics. Um, that in one sense, at least, um, the focus on police sort of reestablishes or reifies the state in, in kind of many, many of its kind of senses that we've been talking about as a juridical apparatus, right? As this just this repressive apparatus that you know you might confront on the streets, you might even defeat on the streets, you might even rout the police, right? In one sense, this is the story of Tahrir and the Egyptian revolution, right? You beat the police, you peg them back, you burn the stations, but you realize that actually the, the hole runs much deeper than that, right? You never get to the deeper questions of, you, know, you even depose the leader, but what came to be called the deep state, let alone the flows of capital or, or deeper economic infrastructures remain fairly untouched. But I think there's also another sense to this feeling of overemphasis, which also I felt came out, at least to me, it's what spoke to me in, in, in your interventions, um, which is something of a few kind of uh, people have been making recently. There's, a, there's an article by the EndNotes Collective from a couple of months ago, which kind of makes this point, I think a little bit provocatively and maybe not entirely convincingly, but you know, in, enough to give food for thought, which is you know, the confrontation with police can, can not only reestablish a sort of martial warlike uh, zero sum relationality, but that it 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 often leads to, at least at some level, um, exactly the kind of uh, diffusion and diversification and paramilitarization um, that we kind of see today, and that the, that it, in some senses part of what's happening is a kind of switching of of emphasis, where you know the ruling apparatus is is the party of anarchy in a certain sense, right? And protesters have been thrown into this place where they, they have to play the, uh, the, the the party of order in a certain sense, right? You have to refuse the kind of warlike binaries of of state power in a certain sense. Um, so I just wanted to throw that as a as a kind of provocation out there. Um, there are maybe we can just bunch a bunch of questions and see if there's time for a, for any kind of response. Um, there is a question from the audience. I don't see any raised hands, but there's a question from the audience. Um, one directed to Amar about, and I'll read it. I'll read it now. Um, about the need to think about how to disaggregate this seemingly monolithic police, and they want to ask how much the agents within the state, from ICE to military police and beyond view themselves through these divisions versus viewing themselves as a singular force. Um, and if they do see themselves at least partly as a singular social political group, how might we think about the political implications of that self-identification within the US, but also beyond? Um, you picked up, Amar, on the question on citizen sovereignty. Um, there is another question about um, the trans military ban, and uh, if anyone's willing to speak more to the links between militarism and gender, um, and the sort of uh, reversal of the Biden administration of that ban. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts to any of that, but I'll turn it over to you because that's pretty much all I have in the chat here. 
I can answer a little bit the question from Aman Banerjee about identity and cross. So I think uh, what absolutely we have to recognize is that um, in the past few months in the United States, to start with, uh, it really is the first time, at least since the kind of machine politics days of the early 20th century in which police have very explicitly lined up behind a political party. I know, Stuart, you can comment on this more um, specifically. But uh, so in that sense of identification, the fact that police unions and um, across the country and, you know, members of explicit members of ICE and militias all kind of network on platforms together um, and have, you know, the Blue Lives Matter movement or various um, born again Christian movements in the police that network together with um, militias and, you know, but specifically to support uh, Trump. So that is, a, at least for this generation, that is an innovation. Um, so I don't, so for me, that invites us to continue to think about the important locations and internal differences within this formation, because I think even more than ever, um, we need a defetishized lens for looking at the police that doesn't reproduce th their own self fetishization as a, you know, uh, armament obsessed and white masculinist type of identity with a capital I, you know, identity movement. Um, so I think interesting and certainly in, in Brazil and around the world, you see a huge jump in the numbers of police officers and military officers and militia leaders running in elections. Um, so this is a part of this era. And I, th and I, th I think just it would tie into my other point in that police to a less extent and military to great extent have the kind of last hold on kind of positive state identity as something who can get something done. But of course, that's the wrong kind of things that they can get done. So that's exactly why we need to um, reverse those imaginaries of the state. I, I just wanted to um, refer to uh, an article that came out in the Washington Post uh, yesterday or, or the day before that was about um, how police uh, administrators are now dealing with this, uh, you know, threat that that the Capitol insurrection revealed that, you know, of course, they had no idea existed, which is, you know, the presence of, of uh, white power extremists within police forces. So it's like, this is the first time it's ever occurred to them. That's kind of like the way the article is framed. This is the first time it's occurred to them. Now they, have, they feel like they have to act upon it. And I think there's this quote in it, um, which is just super interesting that I want to want to read because um, it kind of connects um, what what Paul uh, and um, Nadia have both been saying um, in different ways. So so it's a quote from the the head of the Fraternal Order of Police, who is on record as being a vociferous supporter of Trump. You know, and he's asked is is extremism in police in the United States a problem? And he says, um, he doesn't think it's a widespread problem, but you know, there, there could be some better approaches, um, including mental health services. And then this is a quote, he says, most of us have one or two traumatic events in our life. Officers can have 60 or 70. We really need to recognize the stresses of this job. So what he's saying is like, the trauma that police experience, and and in that you, you know you 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 can lump like their everyday operational activities plus you know Black Lives Matter protests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is the reason why they become white supremacists, um, which you know I, I, hopefully I, it's clear that you know this is um, deeply problematic and um, ridiculous and offensive. But um, you know it's 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 just a a, a way of I totally agree with the point of inflating the importance of the police, even though I, you know, get paid to do that. On the other hand, like, I think we have to recognize that, like, police, uh, that is their project as well, right? You know, calling attention to themselves, calling attention to the traumas they experience, and the traumas are the reason that they engage in bad behavior, like storming the Capitol, you know, it's like, 
getting out of this this circuit is is quite challenging um because i do think you know we, we need to critique it even as yeah there is a problem of you know it's like we don't we should not fall into the same problem as like the capital insurrectionists fell into which is like they got inside the capital looking for the government and then the government wasn't there it was just like some paintings and some marble and whatever so you know we need to avoid this but but i um i also would i guess just say like we, we can't let go of the critique um fundamental critique of the police and i think um we need to engage in some of these um approaches that, that we've heard about it, you know, with um, abolition, defund, and, and other, you know, terms that um, maybe other movements outside the U.S. Um, have have been using that we should familiarize ourselves with. Just as an aside, Stuart, so the um, discourse of specifically moral injury has is migrating into the police at this point. That it's a it's a kind of diagnosis that's now um, circulating in police circles. Although again, I think what's interesting is the reception of it is gonna be more divisive than it is among troops, even if you have an overlap of personnel. Okay, um, we're, at, we're at time. I just wanna thank our participants again. This was really incredibly riveting and rich.